Um, so, so yeah, my name's my name's Eben Upton, and I run a I founded and run part of a thing called Raspberry Pi, which is based here in Cambridge. Um, we make little computers for kids. Um, I thought I might talk a little bit today about well, first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about how I ended up doing this. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about why Cambridge, why how I ended up doing it in Cambridge, and why Cambridge remain what has been for a very long time and remains. Um, probably one of the two or three places in the world that you could feasibly hope to do something like Raspberry Pi. Um, and now I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, the, the history of the Pi project itself from uh, kind of from the early days in sort of 2006 uh, to 2008, all the way through to the present day. And some of the things have gone well and some of the things have gone badly. Um, I'm always a little bit reluctant to try and draw lessons from something like Raspberry Pi. One of the things you find is, um, I mean, if you've been to kind of talks by entrepreneurs, uh, very often they have the flavor of trying to, make, trying to make it look like it was a plan, right? People like human beings like narrative. Human beings are narrative creatures. We've been telling each other stories for tens of thousands of years. Um, when something happens, it's very natural to try to make a story out of it. Um, and that's got positive, that's got positive sides. I think a lot of, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the story about Cambridge is a very, it's one of Cambridge's assets that we have this story about it being a great place to do computing. But it's also something which can kind of tr tend to kind of simplify and um, smooth over lots of things that happen to you that are contingent and um, uh, so we're going to try and try and avoid that a little bit so so we're in Cambridge now um, Cambridge has been a place for doing computing pretty much as long as there have been computers uh, as long as there's, there's been compu uh, computing and computers to do computing with um, Obviously, this was the home of, uh, this is where Alan Turing did a vast amount of his work in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Um, so we have this kind of, we have this theoretical computer science back there. There's sort of two, two themes in computing in Cambridge. There's a theoretical theme and there's a practical theme. And, the theor and Turing's an interesting guy because he kind of embodies both of these traditions. So he's a guy who's a pure mathematician um, who was responsible for fundamental advances in computer theory but he was also a guy who, in the way that he cast a lot of his, uh, his, the thought experiments in his research, were thought experiments about machines. They were thought, thought experiments uh, where uh, Alonzo Church, who was doing a lot of, of similar, he was kind of, kind of doing basically the same stuff at the same time, and the, you know, the Church Turing thesis is named after both of them together, where Church, as a mathematician, saw it as an exercise in functions, in writing down functions in maths. Um, Turing saw a lot of his work as being, um, thinking about the operations the machine, obviously the Turing machine, which is a machine that moves up and down along a tape, reading and writing symbols on the tape, it's a machine. I mean, it's a thought experiment machine. It's not a machine that anyone's ever really been able to build, um, uh, but it's it's a machine. And then, of course, he then goes on to uh, he then goes on to to, to go and do. Um, to go and do stuff in the Second World War, to go and do code breaking stuff in the Second World War, which was all about making machines. So, you know, Cambridge is, Cambridge is somewhere where people have been making machines for pretty much as long as we've had computers. Um, we've had a uh, something, we have the computer laboratory down in West Cambridge. We've had a computer laboratory or something like it. That organization has a heritage that stretches back into the 1930s. So the Cambridge University Computing Laboratory was originally the bit of the university that looked after the, the analog computers. Long before we, before we had digital computers, we had analog computers that could solve differential equations. And the Community Laboratory as an organization is the direct descendant of the bit of the university that used to manage the analog computers. Um, in the late 1940s, um, there, were, there, were a number of there are a number of universities in the world that have some sort of claim to have made the first digital computer for some narrow definition of first digital computer. And all of these universities have some, they have some way of carving out their little definition of first. Now, Cambridge's definition of first is kind of fun. We um, in the late 1940s, um, a team led by Morris Wilkes built a machine called EDSAC. Now, EDSAC is the first digital computer in the sense that it is the first computer to have been used by people other than the people who built it. So it's the first computer to have provided a widespread service to other people within the university. So a lot of the X-ray crystallography work that happened in the late 40s and early 50s in Cambridge used EDSAC. The researchers from the Department of Chemistry were using EDSAC to run jobs to assist them in their, uh, to assist them in their work. Um, and so we've we've been making computers we've been making computers since the late 1940s in Cambridge, um, and uh, it was only in the mid to late 1960s that the university actually gave up on making its own computers. It was only at that point that commercially available computers got to a stage where it was worth the university going out and buying computers on the open market rather than you know rolling its own computers by hand. So we made a lot of our own computers. We stopped making big computers. In the 1970s, home computing came along. 
Um, and it turned out Cambridge, for a lot of the same reasons that we were a great place to make giant computers in the 40s and 50s, Cambridge turned out, because of the people who are here and the things that those people know how to do, Cambridge turned out to be a great place to, uh, in this, to, to, build, um, to build microcomputers as well. So obviously we have these two, kind of two big successful organizations in Cambridge in the 1970s and 1980s, Sinclair Research uh, and its descendants, uh, and ACORN, uh, which for some value of descendant is also a descendant of Sinclair. Um, and so in the, late, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Cambridge is spitting out all of these machines, um, of which this is the most notable, from my point of view, these ones are the most notable example, the BBC Micro, which is now 35 years old, not 30 years old, Jason. Um, so we, we, so you know, the BBC Micro, which was the first machine that I had as a child. So there's this kind of like, there's this, there's this story that comes all the way through from the 1930s with analog computers through the 40s with code breaking, the 40s and 50s and 60s with machines that, uh, with large machines that were built largely by the university here, to the 1970s and 1980s where there are smaller but rapidly growing companies building um, the British home computers of my childhood. So in, um, got my BBC Micro in 1988. Well, my BBC Micro when I was 10 years old. Now, I'd seen, like a lot of people of my generation, I'd had a BBC Micro at, um, I'd had a BBC, we'd had BBC Micros at school, and they'd sat there in the corner of the classroom. And the interesting thing is, when we look back at the 1980s, um, from the point of view of trying to kind of reboot, we got this idea, Raspberry Pi's trying to reboot, it's trying to give you guys the opportunity to learn to program computers the same way I did when I was a kid. And when we think about rebooting it, we think, look back at the 1980s with rose-colored spectacles, and we think, wow, the 1980s were amazing, you know, everyone was learning to code in schools. It's absolute nonsense, of course. You know, these machines, you know, these machines, I guess, have been gathered from schools, mostly. And these machines will have sat in the corner of the classroom, and they won't really have been used to learn to program on. The ones that my school weren't used to program on, they were used to run French software, in, in English teaching software, where they were used very much in the way that most schools use their PCs at the moment. They were used as utility platforms for running other pieces of software. It just happens that they have this behavior that you turn them on and they do that wonderful two-tone beep and they give you a command prompt. Um, and so those of us in the 1980s who got involved in computing, they were largely getting involved in computing by accident. We were getting involved in computing because these machines booted into BASIC and the first thing you could do with them was to program them. Um, so I, had a, I played with the BBC Micro at school. I um, bought one, 220 pounds, upgraded Model A, upgraded BBC Micro Model A, second hand, disk drive, 220 pounds in 1988. Um, I only called my bedroom for about three or four years. I loved it. I mean, it was, I used to play a lot with Lego. I guess people in this room play with Lego, yeah? Lego? Yeah. Um, I had a lot, of, I've still got a lot of Lego. I have a giant box of Lego. But the stuff went, that is, it's in a big box. It's in my parents' attic. Um, and it went into that box the day I got my BBC Micro. You know, it's still in the box that I put it in. I'll just, I'll just put it in this box and I'll come right back to it. And that was, um, yeah, that was 28 years ago. Um, I love my BBC Micro. I mean, I spent every single penny I had on it. Um, it was a fantastic piece of kit, and it really replaced Lego in my life as the thing that I used to do creative stuff with. It was the platform that I was creative on as a child. Um, I had my BBC. I upgraded to an Amiga. Um, and I and a bunch of my friends, um, because we... I really wanted to be a games programmer. That was, my, that was my thing. And I and a bunch of my friends... Because we'd had these machines and because we got tricked into becoming computer programmers by having a readily programmable computer in the corner of the classroom and then in the corner of our bedroom, um, when we started to think about what we were going to do when we came to university, it seemed kind of obvious to come and be computer programmers. Um, and when we decided we want to go and study computer science, because of the history that Cambridge has in computing, um, it seemed like one of the obvious places to go. It's kind of weird that kind of probably the two obvious places to go and study computer science in the, in the UK are Cambridge and Manchester, right? They actually end up being the two places that Alan Turing was uh, during his career. Um, and I applied to both and I got into Cambridge. Uh, I turned up here in 1996 and to get into the computer science in 1996 you had to, an applicant ratio of about six or seven to one. So we had five to 600 applicants for about 80 places. And that's pretty typical for Cambridge, right? You want to get in here to, to study uh, classics, you want to get in here to study physics, you want to get in here to study maths. Uh, that's pretty typical. You want to get in here to study veterinary science or medicine, it's much worse than that. Um, but very few subjects have an application ratio um, lower than maybe four to one. Um, so it's tough to get in. I turned up, and I literally turned up at the university here thinking I knew everything about computer programming. I've been programming on BBC since I was, BBC since I was eight. 
my own BBC since I was 10, had my Commodore Amiga. I got my Commodore Amiga when I was 14, and I never programmed my Commodore Amiga in anything other than assembly language. So I never, on BBC, I used BBC Basic and assembly language. My Commodore Amiga, I couldn't afford anything. Uh, the, the cheapest programming tool for the Commodore Amiga was an assembler, about 20 pounds. It was the only programming tool I could afford. Um, and so my Commodore Amiga, I'd been programming, when I turned up here, I'd been programming for three years in 68,000 assembly language, and I, I literally thought I knew everything there was to know about computing. Um, uh, I turned up, and that was a pretty common attitude. And in fact, when I, was, when I arrived here, the first thing that they would do in the first year, really, was the, the, the first order of business was to beat people like me over the head and convince us that there was lots of stuff left to learn. Um, functional programming is a fantastic uh, tool for doing that to kids. You know, you sit someone down in front of, you know, to 18-year-olds, you sit, you sit someone down in front of uh, standard ML or something who's been programming in assembly language for um, five years, and you've just got no idea what to do. So... It was great for the university. We had an enormous number of people applying. We had a um, enormous number of people applying. We could assume that people, kept, when people came in the door, they knew so much about programming that they um, that they that really our job was to beat them over the head, not to teach, not do remedial work, but to uh, to kind of teach them that there was stuff left to learn. Um, and we got fat and happy on the back of this. I think as a university, we got we were really really happy. And of course, what we were ignoring was that engineering subjects, computing and engineering subjects, have a horrible recruitment challenge. Um, absent things like the BBC Micro, they have a horrible recruitment challenge, which is we don't teach engineering at school. Right? We teach physics at school, we teach maths at school, we teach French at school. And if you're good at one of those subjects, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to think, I want to go and do some more of that at university. Um, computing and engineering, we don't really teach thing, we don't really teach engineering subjects at school. And therefore, engineering subjects struggle with that kind of like cognitive barrier I think, where people have to have a leap of imagination to say, I'm good at physics, I'm going to go stru study structural engineering. You know, it's actually quite a barrier to overcome. And what we hadn't realized, I think, as a university, was that we were getting a free ride on the back of computing as a, as a way for people to get involved in, 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 interested in and experienced with and involved in engineering. Um, so I arrived here in 1996. I've been in Cambridge nearly 20 years. Uh, there probably isn't one of those years that I haven't planned to leave. I uh, haven't made it yet. I got pretty close about five years ago. About five years ago, I got halfway through applying for an American visa, and then, uh, then Raspberry Pi fell on me and uh, has crushed me into the ground and hasn't got up yet. Um, so, yeah, I turned here in 96. Ten years later, I was, I was finishing off a PhD here. And I got involved in, in interviewing people. Now, interviewing people to come to Cambridge is enormously good fun. Um, you get people come in. I, I have no idea. I mean, my abiding impression of, sort of 2004, 2005 when I was doing this was I had no idea how I ever had the guts to do this. Um, because, you know, you, you have a half-hour academic interview. This is St. John's. You have a half-hour academic interview. And you open, the, uh, you, know, you open the door. And you'll see people in these half-hour blocks. And there'll be somebody sitting at the next victim sitting on a chair out the front. Um, and you open the door and the person jumps. It reliably it happens every time. They think it's their turn. And then you're actually letting the previous person out and you've got like five, five, minutes to go and, uh, five minutes to go and write up your notes. And then you open the door again and they jump again. You know? And they come in and then once they've calmed down, you, you know, you're, you're, it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful experience because you're meeting incredibly bright people. You're meeting incre incredibly bright 16 and 17 year olds who are enthousi about, enthusiastic about your subject, want an opportunity to come and study at the university that you, I mean, I'm incredibly, as you probably gather, I'm incredibly proud of Cambridge as a university, and you've got people who really want to come and study a subject you're passionate about at a university that you think is one of the best places in the world. And that's an incredible privilege. Um, but there weren't any people. There weren't any kids. Um, we'd gone from having five or 600 people wanting to apply to study at the university here to barely more than 200 in a decade. Between 1995 and 2005, these numbers had just dropped off a cliff. It was sort of steady 10 to 15% a year decline, year on year on year on year, just grinding away. Um, and it was a potential catastrophe. We never got to a point where we didn't have enough good people, but it was getting pretty desperate. I mean, it was getting, we were only a year or two, I think, at the point where this curve bottomed out, we were only a year or two away from not being able to find enough good people to come and study computer science here. Um, and that was 2005, 2004, 2005, 2006. And we were down to barely more than 200 people for 80 or 90 places. Um, and a bunch of us at the university started to ask ourselves what had happened. Um, and the idea we came to was that these machines, these programmable machines that sit there and go beep when you turn them on, 
and kind of lure you into programming, give you a slippery slope. There wasn't, there wasn't as a child, there was not one day when I thought, I'm going to be a computer programmer. You know, there wasn't a moment where I thought, that's what I'm going to do for my career, that's what I'm going to do at university, that's what I'm going to do for my job. I was just kind of like suckered into it by the incredible programmability of these pieces of hardware. And the idea we came to was that these devices, as these devices went away and they were replaced in the best case by machines like the PC, which are programmable. I mean, they're a bit less programmable than this, right? You have to kind of choose to go and program a PC. You're not going to get tricked into programming a PC in the same way I was tricked into programming uh, a BBC. But yeah, are programmable. And so in the best case, they were replaced by PCs. In the worst case, they were replaced by things like Nintendos, you know, replaced by games consoles. Games consoles are awful, right? Because games consoles are massively powerful machines which are designed to not be programmable. Because they usually, or historically at least, have been sold at a loss. Right? And so the business model for games consoles is you sell them at a loss, and then you monopolize the supply of software for them. If you're Nintendo, you don't allow anyone to write software for a Nintendo without getting a royalty from them. And then you make back the loss that you made on the hardware, and you, then you start to make a profit. So these are machines that are not just not programmable. They have to not be programmable in order to sustain the business model of the people who are making them. Um, the really insidious thing is because they have that business model, they can be made very cheap. The hardware can be made very cheap. So Non-programmable hardware drives out programmable hardware. It's like Gresham's law, right? Non-programmable hardware drives out programmable hardware because it can be made more cheaply. And so what had happened was, in the early 1990s, my BBC Micro had been replaced by, a super, by Super Nintendos. No one ever got suckered into becoming a, pr a computer programmer by, a super, by, by their Super Nintendo. And then 10 years later, it's a pipeline, right? You're pouring people your age into the front of this pipeline right? And then you learn a lot about computers, and then when you're 18, you pop out and you go to university and you do computer programming, and then when you're 21, you pop out and you either go into a doctorate or you, or you go into industry. And there's this wonderful pipeline. And the thing is, at the early 1990s, a few years after I was doing this stuff, someone just stopped pouring people into the pipeline. That's all that happened. It just dried up. And then 2005, we're looking around blinking. In the 1990s, we didn't understand how good we had it at the university here. We didn't understand where our students were coming from. And then 10 years later, we didn't understand where they'd gone to. Um, and really, Raspberry Pi is the result of a bunch of us at the university here in Cambridge um, looking around and saying, well, that's not very good. Um, I wonder if we could make a thing that would occupy the same niche that these machines did. So I wonder if we could make a machine which is fun. Um, these machines, people bought these machines, particularly the Spectrum. I, mean, I don't want to like stereotype Spectrum owners as computer gamers, but the Spectrum in particular, there's a weird class system thing, right, in the in the in in the in the 19, 1980s computer 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 owners. There is a weird thing you can see, Spectrum um, ST owners, um, Atari ST, Spectrum and Atari ST, and BBC Micro and Amiga owners. And there is a real, the same people who bought Spectrums bought STs, and the same people who bought BBCs bought, um, uh, um, bought Amigas. Um, and the difference is about 100, the difference is about 100 pounds, right? Um, I'm a BBC Amiga, I was a BBC Amiga guy on a, on a Spectrum, uh, on a Spectrum um, uh, ST budget. So my BBC was very old and very broken, and I had to hit it on the top in order to get it to boot up, and that's how I got one cheaply. And then the ST, my, my Amiga was a shop soiled, my Amiga was a shop soiled ST with like corners knocked off the case. So I was able to, I was able to fight my way up into the, uh, <laughs> fight my way up into the aristocracy of uh, 1980s computing. Um, but we wanted machines which were fun, that were something other than just, um, uh, that, that were, they, 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 we didn't want to build something which was worthy. We wanted to build a machine which was fun and would sit there and would appeal to young people um, as a machine they could play games on, as a machine they could surf the web on, as a machine that they could, um, you know, that they could pl play video. So we wanted something which was fun and we wanted something which was programmable. So we wanted a machine which was powerful enough that we could bundle every tool onto it, every programming tool that you've ever heard of, so people would have a maximum chance to uh, bump into a programming environment, a programming tool that they found exciting. Um, we wanted it to be robust. I owned my computers when I was a kid. I mean, I've just, you know, they were incredibly precious to me. And I think that owning hardware is much better than borrowing hardware. Owning hardware is much better than having somebody else own hardware and letting you use it. Um, the idea is this is supposed to be a machine that you can own, not a machine that your school owns or that your parents own and let you use. And that's really important because that means if you break it, it's your responsibility. Right, you don't need to worry about getting into trouble for breaking your Raspberry Pi because 
it's yours, and if you have a thing and you break it, well, that's your problem. Um, and it's intended to be cheap enough, and that's the fourth thing. It's intended to be cheap enough that if you do break it, you can, uh, you can go buy another one. And so we have this idea that if we could just make something that did all those four things, well, maybe we could refer reverse this decline that we had. Um, so we spent a lot of time. So this was 2006. We spent a lot of time trying different stuff. Um, the first machine that I made was um, a... Uh, a bit like an Arduino, actually. It was based on the same chips. I don't know if any of you have played with Arduino. Based on the same chip as in Arduino. Um, it was certainly cheap, and it was certainly just about programmable. It wasn't any fun, though. You guys wouldn't have enjoyed playing with it, right? It was kind of like... Um, it was really, really, really primitive. Um, and so we tried that. That didn't work. Tried another thing. We had, now had a machine which just ran Python. That was about 2008. And that was kind of fun, because that had a 3D graphics accelerator, and that could play video. But it was still a very kind of special purpose platform. It was built on a, based on a, a chip that we developed here at Broadcom in Cambridge. Um, and the interesting thing, though, was that felt like a computer, and it ran Python. And the interesting thing about that version is that's what gave us our name. So people ask us, why is Raspberry called, why, why are we called Raspberry Pi? Well, we're Raspberry, Raspberry, because, um, uh, because of fruit-named computer companies. There have been a bunch of fruit-named computer companies. There aren't actually that many unused fruit left. Um, we have, obviously, there's the big one in uh, California. Uh, there's Blackberry. Um, Acorn, which is a um, Cambridge company. Te Acorn's, uh, Acorn is technically a fruit. Tangerine. We have tangerine here in Cambridge. Uh, apricot uh, in the UK. So there's a long tradition of fruit in computer companies. We actually did choose raspberry because it's the rudest fruit as well, because it's like... That thing, that is, that's, that is, that is true. Um, and then Pi is Pi is Python. You know, the Pi in Raspberry Pi is the Pi in Python. It's P-I, not P-Y, because we thought the Pi letter would make a great logo. We never used that. We just have a picture of a Raspberry as our logo. Um, and um, the, Raspberry, uh, the Raspberry Pi logo, um, it's a buckyball, right? It's a C60, uh, it's a, it's a C60 atom. Um, the interesting thing about it is there are these little dots here, if you took the whole of the Raspberry, there'd be 32 dots. So, so there's, there's, there's numbers in it. There'd be 32 dots for our 32 bits. And if you look at the ones that are visible, there are 11 visible, which is the ARM 11 that we have in Raspberry Pi 1. Um, but anyway, so Raspberry Pi. So we picked the name of Raspberry Pi at the point where we thought we almost had something which was shippable. We picked the name, um, and, that was, uh, and then we incorporated the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So people often ask, why did we do Raspberry Pi as a charity? Why am I, you know, why did I drive? Why did I drive here in a beat-up old car? How did I, why did I sell 10 million computers and then drive here in a beat-up old car? Why did we configure it as a charity? We configured it as a charity because we're trying to do an inherently charitable thing. There's an alignment between Raspberry Pi being a charity rather than a commercial company, um, and the fact that what we're trying to do is something which is for the good of the country, which is for the good of the world, as it turns out, for the good of people. Um, so we incorporated a charity here in Cambridge, a bunch of us, uh, people from the university, uh, a chap called David Braben, who many of you may have come across, who wrote uh, Elite for the BBC Micro. So lots of the people who are involved in Raspberry Pi have a BBC Micro connection. Mine is a fairly slender connection in that I owned one, but we have somebody who wrote probably the most successful, one of our founding trustees wrote probably the most successful game for the BBC Micro. Um, Jack Lang, another of our founding trustees, is a long-time uh, Cambridge businessman and was involved in writing a lot of the software for early, uh, early BBC Micro software. Um, so we incorporated this foundation. We called it Raspberry for fruit and Pi for Python. Um, and this was 2008. Um, and we, we bumbled along. The machine that ran Python wasn't the real thing either. Um, but by 2011, we had something that we thought was a saleable product. Um, and all the way through, I said we had this strong connection to BBC Micro. All we ever wanted to do was call this a BBC Micro. All we ever wanted was called BBC Micro Model C or something. We, we, we love the BBC Micro brand. Um, and we kept having these meetings with the BBC. And the BBC kept telling us that there was no way that they could let us use the BBC name. They said it's impossible for us these days. You would never be able to do the BBC Micro today. Um, it is impossible for us to make a piece of educational computing hardware with the BBC brand on it. Uh, and we had a lot of meetings and no dice. Um, and... Um, our last roll of the dice was with a chap called Rory Kathleen Jones, who's a, uh, a BBC technology correspondent. Um, and we thought, 
he might be able to help us. And so we went down to David and I went down to see him. And we took this very early prototype of the Raspberry Pi, which you wouldn't recognize. It looks like, it actually looks a little bit like the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is the $5 Raspberry Pi that we launched last year. Um, but it looks like, no, it doesn't look like the Raspberry Pi that we launched in 2012. We took it down and showed it to him and said, hey, can we stick the BBC brand on this? And he said, well, two things. One, probably no. And two, I'm not remotely the right person to ask this question of. Uh, but three, would you mind if I took a video of it and put it on my blog? Um, and so he took a video just of David holding it up. It wasn't running. He was just holding up the hardware and just, just, just showing it to the camera. Um, and um, he got 600,000 YouTube views in two days for, 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 for his video. Um, and it was, it was an incredible couple of days because I sat there at work at Broadcom um, pressing F5 and watching my How Popular Are You counter count up on YouTube. And it was, it was really fantastic. And at the end of the second day, I sat down opposite my wife for dinner um, and we... Um, and Luz has been involved in Raspberry Pi right since the start. Um, and we had this moment where we realized that we promised 600,000 people that we'd build them a $25 computer. And we had absolutely no real idea how to do it. We had the back of an envelope calculation that said the silicon cost a lot less than $25, so this should probably work. But none of us knew anything about actually making physical product. Most of us who were involved in it, who'd been in business before, had been software engineers. And the nice thing about software is that making lots of copies of software is not particularly hard. You know, it's just it's information, information wants to be free, right? Um, and so we had this, we had this kind of We'd all accidentally nailed our reputations to the mast, right? We'd all accidentally stood up in public and said, we're totally going to make this thing. Um, and so 2011, we, I spent a lot of, um, I spent a lot of 2011 trying to first to figure out how to make this hardware, along with Pete Lomas, who's one, another one of our founding trustees, and in fact, a Manchester person. So this is the other, another recurrence of that thing where Cambridge and Manchester together are kind of the British computing industry. Um, and he's, uh, so he's based up in Cheshire. Um, he designed the first Raspberry Pi. You know, we spent a lot of time trying to actually figure out how to turn that back of an envelope calculation of what a Raspberry Pi could be made for from, a, from the silicon side into an actual manufacturable product. And it turns out the thing that kills you is not the silicon. You focus on the silicon because the silicon costs dollars, right? You know, something like Raspberry Pi, you've got, you look at the board, it's got three bits of silicon on it. It's got the core silicon, it's got the memory, and it's got the, the network chip. And you look at those things and you obsess, o you obsess over those because those cost dollars. Those cost a whole number of dollars. Everything else on that board costs cents. The, the, the PCB itself actually could cost more than a dollar sometimes. Um, but everything else on that board costs cents. Um, and so the back of an envelope calculation really just focused on those expensive components. But actually what kills you when you're trying to build something like Raspberry Pi is not the dollars, it's the cents. right? Because even Raspberry Pi 1, now Raspberry Pi 2 probably has nearly... Raspberry Pi 3 probably has nearly 300 components on it. Even a Raspberry Pi 1 has about 180 components on it. Um, but while a lot of those 180 components are things like resistors and capacitors, which cost a fraction of a cent, there are a significant, quite a large number of those 180 um, items cost several cents. You know, an HDMI connector, you know, what does an HDMI connector cost? What does a USB connector cost? What does a MagJack cost? So MagJack is the, the, the network connector, the RJ45 network connector, that's not just a dumb connector, it actually has transformers inside that couple the, um, the network signal from the, um, uh, that couple the network signal from the, uh, from, from the network chip onto the network medium. Um, all of these things cost at least tens of cents. Right? And that's actually what you drown in. And we found ourselves in 2011 kind of drowning in cost um, in these, this, this large number of medium, of medium price devices. Um, so yeah, we had a busy time in 2011. Um, by the end of 2011, you know, we thought we could make it. Um, we were getting a bit worried. Though. I said Liz, my wife, has been involved in this for a long time. Um, she was a freelance journalist. Um, and she's, she dropped all her freelance journalism on the floor. Uh, in 2011, when, when, we had, when we had our accidental launch announcement, she dropped all of her work on the floor and just started managing our community, running our blog, running our Twitter feed, running our forums on the website. Um, and she did a disturbingly good job of it because by the end of 2011, we had tens of thousands of people on the forum, lots of website traffic. And it was becoming apparent to us that particularly as a charity, now the, the, the charitable thing has worked extremely well for us, right? The charitable thing means that we are a closed loop organization, right? We are, um, all of the money that comes in is either recycled inside my organization, which is Raspberry Pi Trading, um, to do more engineering, to make more cool Raspberry Pis, or it's paid up to the foundation, which uses it to do, to run the educational mission. You know, we're a closed loop organization, um, but the, the downside is we can't go raise money. 
you know, if you're in this, particularly if you're in this town, so this is another thing that's great about Cambridge, if you're in this town and you've got a great idea and you can demonstrate, as we had by the end of 2011, that you can build your product and sell it for a profit, um, then there are lots and lots of people in this town who have money and there are lots and lots of people in this town who have the experience of turning bright ideas and money into workable businesses in the past. Um, the problem is, in order to go and get your hands on that money, you have to give up equity, right? You have to be able to give up shares in your organization. If you're a charity, you don't have any shares. And so we had a um, viable, saleable product that could be sold at a profit, and an organization whose constitution and setup prevented us from going and getting the money that we needed in order to make it work. Um, and our kind of interim plan for making it work was to go and um, was to basically mortgage our houses um, and uh, go and take the money, buy chips, um, make Raspberry Pis, sell the Raspberry Pis, get the money back, buy more chips. And this, is, this that thing is called the working capital loop. I mean, in business, that's the working capital loop. And the problem with the working capital loop is that, as you, is that it takes time to move money around this loop, right? So you have to buy the chips, and you don't get the money back from your customers in order to buy more chips immediately. And as you wanna, if you want to grow that loop, if you want to inflate that working capital loop and make more computers uh, per unit time, you need to pour money in. So generally, most businesses, as they grow, suck money into themselves. And we weren't able to, we had a finite amount of money, which was the amount of money that our trustees were prepared to risk to make this work. And that amount of money was about a quarter of a million pounds. Um, and a quarter of a million pounds, quarter of a million, no, quarter of a million dollars. Uh, and a quarter of a million dollars, if you're making $25 computers, a quarter of a million dollars is basically enough money to build 10,000 computers. And so our model was build 10,000 computers, sell computers, get money back, build more computers. Hopefully get a bit more money back than we put in, so next time we can maybe build 12,000 computers, 10, 11,000, 12,000 computers and grow gradually. Um, because of all the work that had been put into social media, by the end of 2011, it was pretty obvious that we had 50 or 60,000 people who wanted Raspberry Pis. Uh, and therefore, in, given the amount of time it was going to take us to go around the loop, it was going to take us probably a year and a half. It was going to be, if we launched at the start of 2012, it was probably going to be the middle of 2013 by the time that everybody who wanted a Raspberry Pi could get one. And that was just the early adopters, people like people in this room, like, people like us, you know, people who are enthusiastic about technology, even before we started to try to address the educational side. Um, so we were very lucky because what happened, it, so there's another way in which Cambridge is useful. Um, Arm was mentioned earlier. So Arm, probably our most successful Cambridge company, the descendant of Acorn, right? The, the story of computing in Cambridge in the 1980s is largely a story of failure, right? It's, you know, the, the two big companies fail in different ways. Sinclair and Acorn both failed. Um, and the, uh, it's a story of failure, but it's also a story of success because the people who were involved in those organizations then went out into the world, and often into the Cambridge world, into the Cambridge community. And much of the broader tech ecosystem that we have in Cambridge is derived from the people who had worked for those companies, cut their teeth in those companies, and then stayed in Cambridge and went and built stuff. The one sort of pure kind of ray of success shining out from that 1980s experience is ARM, right? They're the descendant of Acorn. They've basically taken over the world. Um, and they've taken over the world using a very interesting model, right? Where everybody else who made chips thought the right thing, thought that the way to turn businesses were a way of turning capabilities and ideas and intellectual property into money, right? Almost everybody else who did chips decided the way to turn the intellectual property involved in, in chips into money was to go and make chips, right? Arm decided that the way to make money out of their intellectual property and chips after an early period of actually making chips was to license that technology to other people and let them make chips. Now, the wonderful thing about licensing as a business model is you're no longer inside that working capital loop. It's somebody else's job to go and get the money and pour the money into the loop in order to grow the business. You sit on the side every time money whizzes around the loop, some of it flies off and lands with you. So you, you collect royalties. You put in that intellectual property in, and then you collect royalties. And that business can grow, and all of the hassle involved in raising capital and managing logistics and inventory is somebody else's problem. And there are people, the wonderful thing is, there are people in the world who are very, very good at solving that problem. Um, and that's what's made ARM so successful. You know, ARM rely on their licensees to do the heavy lifting and making chips, and they concentrate on what they're good at, which is basically two things. Maintaining the technical IP in the, in the various ARM cores that you can license, and maintaining the brand and the community around ARM, so maintaining the ARM partner ecosystem. And being in Cambridge, 
and having this working capital problem, we had an obvious place that we could look for inspiration, and that place was um, that place was ARM. Um, and so at the start of 2012, that's what we did. We turned ourselves into a licensing company. Raspberry Pi is not a computer manufacturer. We're very nearly at 10 million Raspberry Pis now. But Raspberry Pi is not a computer manufacturer. We are an IP licensing company. We design the Raspberry Pi. We maintain and enhance the, te the technical IP in the Raspberry Pi platform. Uh, we maintain the brand and we maintain the community and the ecosystem. And we license those things to our partners. And our partners manage the logistics. And our partners provide the working capital. And we collect a royalty. And that change which happened in the first two months of 2012 before we launched on the 29th of February. We didn't really mean to launch on the 29th of February. It was meant our birthday parties have been kind of odd. Um, this has been the first year that we've actually had a real honest-to-God birthday party. Uh, it was a good birthday party. You know, I mean, saving up for it for four years. Um, but in those, those two months, those first two months in 2012, as we turned ourselves from being a terminally and irrevocably, because we're a charitable foundation, capital-constrained wannabe manufacturing company into an IP licensing company in the model of ARM. That was what enabled Raspberry Pi to scale. We would probably have sold, if we'd not done it, I think we'd probably have sold two or 300,000 Raspberry Pis by now, maybe more, maybe four, 400,000 Raspberry Pis instead of 10 million. Right? That's the difference between... Um, that's what good business... Well, Raspberry Pi succeeded because it's got three things. It's got, it's got great marketing and community. It's a great piece of technology. It's got a great business model. Most things don't have all three of those. ARM is very unusual in, in having all three of those as an, as an organization, and, and we've, really, we've really benefited from that. So 2012, we launched, sold 100,000 on the first day, spent six months trying to figure out how to build 100,000 and get them out the door, um, sold about a million in the first year, sold 1.5 million in the second year, 2 million in the third year, 3 million in the fourth year. Uh, that got us to, that adds up to 8 million, doesn't it? Um, we launched Raspberry Pi 2 in 2015. We launched Raspberry Pi 3 on the 29th of February this year, on our fourth birthday. Um, we sold somewhere between 1 and 2 million Raspberry Pi 3s uh, in the last three and a bit months. Um, uh, we, what else? We make them in the UK. That's the other important thing. Um, like everybody else, when we were trying to get Raspberry Pi off the ground, one of the pieces of IP that we license to our, one of the services we provide to our licensee partners is we arrange the manufacturing. We don't do the manufacturing. We don't pay for the manufacturing, but we do do a lot. We do have a, a quite a deep relationship with our manufacturing partners. And the initial manufacturing solution that we handed off to our partners was a Chinese manufacturing solution. We had the same idea as everybody else. You want to make cheap stuff? Where do you go? You go to China, right? That's where all stuff comes from. Um, the... Um, the cool thing that happened on launch day was I got an email from a guy who said, uh, uh, hi, uh, I represent a Welsh contract manufacturer who thinks that they can make Raspberry Pi cheaply, who thinks they can make Raspberry Pi at your target price. Um, and over the next month, we sent him a bit more data, and he sent a bit more, us a bit more data. And it became apparent to us that, um, uh, that it was going to work. The company was Sony. I didn't realize Sony did contract manufacture, but Sony have a factory in South Wales that used to build televisions. If you've got a Trinitron, an old Trinitron television kicking around in your house, it's probably built in South, probably built in South Wales. Um, this factory, when Sony moved to LCD televisions, didn't get the LCD business. That went somewhere else. Um, and so what they build now is professional broadcast cameras. They build um, some of Sony's professional broadcast hardware. But they also do contract manufacture. We discovered they could build Raspberry Pi. We discovered they could build Raspberry Pi for the same price we were paying in China. And so by the end of 2012, having started to 2012, um, having just about figured out how to make it in China and ramping a Chinese manufacturing solution, by the end of 2012, we were ramping down our Chinese manufacturer solution and ramping up a Welsh manufacturer solution. Now something like of the 10 million Raspberry Pis that are out, roughly 10 million Raspberry Pis that are out there, probably 7 to 8 million are Welsh manufactured. Of the ones we're manufacturing today, probably 80% of the ones that are being manufactured at the moment are manufactured in Wales. The remainder are manufactured in China for the Far Eastern market. Um, it's cheaper to manufacture Raspberry Pi in Wales than it is to manufacture it in China. Right? I was wrong, and I was... This idea of China being a cheap place to make stuff, it's probably true if you're making like an iPad or something, right? If you're making a product that has a lot of touch. 
right, where there's tens of minutes of someone's time screwing little tiny fiddly screws into the back of the thing, right? If what you're making is a Raspberry Pi, which is basically a PCB which goes in an envelope and goes out of the door, um, it has been a long time since it's been more efficient, because most of the work's done by robots. It's been a long time since it was more efficient to build this stuff in China than it was in the UK. So one of, for me, personally, my family from Wales, um, one of the nice things about Raspberry Pi is an opportunity to stand up in front of people all over the world and remind to them that actually they should not make the same mistake that we made with manufacturing. So um, it's gone rather well. Um, Raspberry Pi was Raspberry Pi is a charity. It's a mission-driven organisation. Um, it's it exists to try to its initial uh, you know its initial mission was to get that number of applicants at Cambridge back up to the level it was at in the 1990s. We're actually now above the level we were at in the 1990s. Last year we had 800 applicants to computer science at the University of Cambridge, right? And people are coming in the door knowing the most amazing amount of stuff about computing. It's absolutely fantastic. It took my successor, Rob Mullins, also a Raspberry Pi founder, um, my successor as director of studies at St. John's, it took him a week to interview the 42 applicants. It was also quite nice he had 42 applicants. That's a very nice Cambridge number. Um, but it took him a week to uh, interview his 42 applicants, where it took me an afternoon to interview mine back in 2005. So we've kind of, we've kind of accomplished our primary mission. As we've got bigger, um, as we've sold more Raspberry Pis, Raspberry Pi was only supposed to make a contribution by making the piece of hardware. That was supposed to be the contribution. There wasn't supposed to be general charitable activity going on. All we were supposed to do was make the hardware available. Didn't matter if we made no money doing it, as long as we broke even. Um, the nice thing about selling 10 million of something when you expect to sell 10,000 of something, and of being able to sell it for a profit when you were hoping to only break even, is that you generate money. And if you're a charity and you generate money, then there are all sorts of awesome things that you can do. Um, Raspberry Pi now has 60 people working here in Cambridge and down in London. Uh, 40 of those people, 20 of those people work for me in the, uh, in, on the business side. 40 of the people work for my colleague Philip Colligan, who we recruited last year as chief executive of the foundation, um, doing general charitable stuff, taking the surplus money, taking the outer loop. We have the inner loop of money and the outer loop of money. We have the inner loop of money is us um, recycling money to make Raspberry Pi better. And the outer loop is us returning money up to the foundation. Um, those people working for the foundation are doing teacher training, they're running after school clubs, they're ex helping to explain to government that we have a problem, that we still have a problem, you know. Um, we have a fantastic new curriculum, but we're not spending any money on training teachers. There will always be some problem that we can be trying to solve. Um, but things have gone quite well. Um, there's a whole generation of young people who want to learn to program computers, right? That's got to be a good thing. Um, as there are young people in the room, I should say, um, basically, engineer, if you take a job in engineering, right, you're basically going to spend your entire life being, play, being paid money to muck about. Right? I mean, that is the wonderful thing that I, you know, I said there was never one moment as a child that I said, I'm going to be a computer programmer, I'm going to be an engineer, it's going to be great. You know, I was lured into it. I was suckered into it by these machines here, right? But then I woke up one day, and I was being paid money to basically play with Lego my entire life. Good money. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, for me, you know, for me, one of the wonderful things about this is that we're giving a bunch of young people a chance to get involved in something which has been very good to me, personally. Uh, engineering is, a, is the, everything I have in my life I have because of this thing, you know? Um, and, you know, the wonderful thing about Raspberry Pi is that I'm hoping that there might be one or two of you guys who in 30 years' time will look back on your Raspberry Pi, 35 years' time, will look back on your Raspberry Pi in the same way that I look back on my BBC Micro, and that would be a wonderful thing. And maybe one of you will go and do the Raspberry Pi of, like, 2040, or something. Maybe, maybe we'll screw it all up and drive, drive it into the wall again like we did before. Um, but as long as a few of you, I mean, I think the lesson of ARM is a really important one. I was one little ray escaped from Cambridge in the 1980s, and now look where it is. You know, I, you know, it's been a blast, actually. Um, yeah, it's been a blast. So, yeah, that's Raspberry Pi. Um, I could take some questions. If anyone has some, yes. You talk a lot about the Raspberry Pi Foundation. Yes. Are you actually 
I'm a member of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation, uh, your governance geekery. So Raspberry Pi Foundation um, now has a very mature constitution. So um, Raspberry Pi started because it was, we never expected Raspberry Pi to become big and successful. I so said we never expected to make any money in particular. So it started off with a very informal constitution, just a bunch of us who were members and also trustees. Um, and over time, what we've had to do, because we're now seeing Raspberry Pi as the thing that I hope will outlive me. Oh, we're trying to build an organization, trying to build organizations which are stable over timescales of at least many decades, if not hundreds of years. Another thing that this town is quite good at um, requires careful governance design because, you know, organizations have failure modes, have complex failure modes, particularly once their founders aren't around anymore. Um, so we now have. Raspberry Pi now has membership. Oh, you may have read the blog post. Um, I don't know if you've read any of the stuff on our website about this. Um, but we have uh, members and we have trustees. So the members is quite a lot of people, about 50 people, who are supposed to be representative in some way. So half of them are supposed to be women. You know, we're supposed to be, uh, people are supposed to come from different sectors. Um, in the, you know, so there's a kind of a, there's this big, planning document that tries to describe where, how we try to get our members in order to make sure that they are geographically and sectorally and um, representative. Um, they then elect, they, they can stand to be trustees, they, get, they elect the trustees, so they're both the electoral college and the um, source of trustees, um, and the trustees serve for up to two terms of I think three years each, um, and then the trustees then hold the executive to account. So that's the foundation. And then Raspberry Pi Trading, which is what I run, is a wholly owned subsidiary of um, uh, Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi Foundation. It has fairly conventional corporate governance. It's just a regular commercial company. It just has an unusual shareholder. You know, we just have one shareholder that owns one share in us, and that shareholder happens to be a charity. Um, and that's worked well for us, but it's not something we, that... It's not something that came out of the box pre-configured and working. An enormous amount of work. We're very lucky to have attracted... Um, it's a chap called David Cleveley, who is our chairman, both the chairman of the foundation and the chairman of the board of directors of Raspberry Pi Trading. Um, one of these Cambridge, well, I mentioned there are people in Cambridge who have been around the block a few times. David has been around the block a lot of times. Um, and he is largely responsible for taking our kind of village cricket club style governance, which was appropriate when we were tiny, and turning it into this proper governance structure, which we hope is reasonably proof against the kind of failure modes that happen to long-lived organizations. I, am a, I, was a I was a founding member and trustee and chief executive of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. I am now um, merely, merely a, a member. Um, so I get a vote, which is kind of fun. Um, yeah. Do I come across people who still program in assembly language and machine code? Yes. Um, so I'm a, um, I, I, I'm a software engineer of the subspecies embedded software engineer. Um, so um, most of the people who, there's always a place for it. Uh, the that place is much diminished now. I mean, I was, so we did this morning, we ran a workshop, programming workshop for the BBC Micro that I developed a game for over the course of this week. Um, one of the things it reminds me of is how little these machines can do in BASIC, you know, how little you can get done in a second in BBC BASIC on a BBC Micro and how important historically assembly language was on this, on this generation and the subsequent generation of machines as a way of getting performance out of fairly limited hardware. Obviously, um, the massive increase in hardware performance and the significant but not overwhelming increase in the high, in, in compiler technology has, has squished that a little bit, um, but there's always a place for it. Uh, I wrote... Um, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 lines of assembler for the Raspberry Pi last year. Right, so still in anger. Um, and that's GPU, so that, that, in that case, that's GPU assembler. That's GPU, GPU microcode. Um, yeah, but, I mean, certainly there is a, there's a, there, there's this, there's this, you know, the whole of computing is, is a story of abstraction, right? It's a, it's a story of abstraction hierarchies with, you know, uh, transistors at the bottom, and um, there's a, there, there is actually, I think, a course. There's a, there's a course called Nantetetris, 
um, which takes you all the way through from, and this is my kind of dream idea of what a computing course should be like, right? It takes you all the way from how you design a NAND gate out of transistors, all the way to writing Tetris at the top, and along the way you've met how you make a microprocessor, how memory works, you know, how an, op how an operating system works, how a compiler works, and then, and then Tetris in a high-level language, right? Um, and I think that there's, there's value to that. And I think that there's, I think you can defend the position that everyone should have a bit of an idea of what's going on at the bottom of the stack without devaluing the enormous advantages that we've got from abstraction. I mean, one of the, you know, the, the, the flip side of, there's this kind of rather glib thing that I said about these machines and how they lure you into programming, right? They lure you into programming because they're not very user friendly. Right, and the, 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 the PC, when I compare the PC to the BBC Micro and I say the PC is, oh, it's like an unprogrammable BBC Micro, right? It's actually an enormously user-friendly unprogrammable BBC Micro. Um, and your tablet, which is a fantastic, you know, tablet, which is a fantastic example of a closed device, is actually incredibly liberating for a lot of people who don't want to get involved in typing, you know, star word-wise when they want to edit a document, right? Um, so, yeah, it's... The abstraction thing is the abstraction thing is really important, and I and sometimes when I when I see the young people are doing with computers today, using tools like Scratch, right, which is incredibly abstracted. I see on top of small talk, you know, um, incredibly abstracted. It's kind of amazing, right, how much more sophisticated. I mean, the game, you know, those people who were in the room this morning, the game who were writing this little helicopter game, the amount of typing we had to do to get a little helicopter down the screen, right, was enormous. The amount, of, the amount that you'd need to do in Scratch in order to make something which is 10 times as exciting and fun is negligible. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's challenging. But I, I do sort of think Exeter used to run a business studies course where they taught people assembly language. Yeah, they discontinued it, unfortunately, but it's quite a nice idea. You're training people to be business managers. Uh, in the tech industry and maintaining that line that they should at least know what all of all the money in the end is resting on assembly language. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. Wow, that was a shocking clearly a, clearly a shockingly clearly a shockingly comprehensive uh, a compre shockingly comprehensive talk. Um uh, yeah I should do the blurb then shouldn't I? Um come see us at raspberrypi.org um, those of you who haven't done, um, yeah, we have a website. Um, we talk a lot about, you know, we, we, a lot of effort has gone into making an approachable place for you guys. You know, anyone in this room can come to Raspberry Pi and ask a question, come to the Raspberry Pi forums and ask a question at any level of technical sophistication and be assured of a respectful response. I think that is very important. So come to Raspberry Pi, check out what we do. Thanks very much for your time. <laughs>